So we talked about role models during a um, children's message. Have you ever watched a movie or read a book and you wanted to be like some character in that movie? And then I hear my boys, they're like, oh, I wish I had the power like so-and-so, I was strong. Um, well, have you ever read about some, some real true, I want to say a real true-to-life person and then when you read about this person, you wanted to change your, your life focus. You wanted to change your goals, maybe your ambitions and your plans. I had that happen quite a few times in my life. Um, have you ever heard the story of the hiding place? Anybody? Yep. Corey Ten Boom? Okay. And this is one that I can distinctly remember even when I was, I was nine years old and I watched the hiding place. Of course, then I wanted to read the book. For those of you are not that are not familiar with Corey Ten Boom, I'll quickly tell you her her background and how this affected me. She was the daughter of a Dutch watchmaker, and she was a Christian. Along with her father and other family members, they helped many Jews escape the Nazi Holocaust during World War II. They hid them, much like you hear about the Underground Railroad. You know, the slaves they were hidden. These people hid the Jews. And they helped many of these um, escapes. They built a hiding place in their living quarters for the Jews. They would provide ration cards for them so they would have food to eat. They would have drills so they could practice hiding. And eventually they would pass the Jews off to safety through an underground network, all the while knowing this could mean imprisonment for them if they were caught. Eventually the entire Tin Boom family was arrested. All of them were set free except for Corey, her sister Betsy, and her father. And I can't remember how old they were older at the time. I mean, I think that Corey and Betsy were in their 50s, so father had to have been in his 70s. Um, Corey, Betsy, and the father were sent to concentration camps, and her father died 10 days later. During this time in the camp, Corey and Betsy held worship services after their long, hard days at work using a Bible they had managed to sneak in. While at Ravensbrück, the prison camp, the sisters discussed plans for a place of healing after the war was over. Well, Betsy's health continued to deteriorate, and she died on December 16, 1944, at the age of 59. Fifteen days later, Corey was released. Afterwards, she was told that her release was due to a clerical error, and that a week later, all the women in her age group were sent to the gas chambers. So, Corey Ten Boom returned home in what they called the Hunger Winter. This was during the war. There were not enough supplies. This was a famine that took place in the Netherlands. There was a German blockade. They wouldn't let, you know, shipments through. But she opened her doors to people and fed them, especially to the mentally disabled. And mentally disabled, you know, they had to hide also because they were deemed un unworthy, unacceptable, and the Nazis would get rid of them as well. Well, after the war, Corey returned to the Netherlands to set up a rehabilitation center for concentration camp survivors and accepted anyone in need of care. She returned to Germany in 1946 and met with and forgave two Germans who had been employed at Ravensbrück, one of them who was particularly cruel to her sister Betsy. She went on to travel the world as a public speaker and appeared in more than 60 countries. She wrote many books during this time. And um, she, I think she lived until she was 93, but she kept serving and sharing her story and sharing Christ. But I remember, I mean, I, I like the book so well, I read it again. I'm not one of these people who like to read stuff that much. I mean, not over again, I like to read. But anyway, as I read the story, I was impressed with her life and she told of a time when, you know, the Jews needed these ration cards, and she went in faith and asked for a hundred of them from this, this guy that was kind of working for the government, and she got all hundred of them. So when I, I read about that, it, was, I, it made me want to have that kind of faith. I wanted to have that faith to ask and receive. And when I saw and read about the brave compassion of the Ten Boom family, and later, you know, for the Jews and the released prisoners, it made me want to have a compassionate heart. Reading about their Bible studies in camp, where they were mistreated and underfed, made me want a heart that loved Jesus in spite of the problems in life. So you can see how 
reading and hearing about someone else can stir you to want to be different. When I read about her forgiveness of the guards and her peace that resulted, I wanted to practice forgiveness like that. And seeing her life poured out for others until the day she died made me want to live my life poured out for others. I wanted my life to be about others and not about me. Well, since reading that story and watching the movie at age nine, I, of course, have read many others that have stirred my heart to change and be more like Christ. Well, in the same way that my desires changed when I read about Corey, when we truly see Jesus for who he is, it makes us want to seek him more and to be changed. And we can see how this happened when Jesus came and walked on this earth. There were some who followed Jesus, and they had changed lives because they saw who he really was. And yet there were many who came to him. They just wanted to be healed, which that's, I mean, that's great. But they were just focused on, I just want to be healed, move on with my life. And there was others. We talked about the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus because he wanted eternal life. And that's not a bad thing, but that was his focus. It wasn't, I want you, Jesus. I want to be changed. I've seen you. There was even a man named Simon who all his own interest was, I want Jesus' power. It was more, you know, I want to be either, maybe he wanted money so they would pay him to heal people, or he just wanted to be known for having this great power. But there were those who saw that Jesus was different. They saw that he had something different, and they wanted to learn from him. They wanted to change and to grow, and they wanted to be set free inside. We're going to look at some of these examples. Let's turn to John 1 and read verse 14, then we'll skip to 35. John 1, verse 14, and then we will read 35 to 41. It says here, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Then we'll skip down to verse 35. Now, between these verses, John the Baptist is preaching. He's baptizing people, and he baptizes Jesus. And it says in verse 35, The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. So these disciples listened to Jesus, but how did truly listening to Jesus change their attitudes and their goals? Well, first of all, they followed Jesus. They left their nets, they left their plans for the day, and they also brought someone else to Jesus. Another example is Mary Magdalene. Does anybody know anything about Mary Magdalene? Any of you kids? What about her? Do you know anything about her? What did Jesus do for her? Jesus cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene. And it says in Luke 8, 3, that she provided for Jesus out of her substance. She took action to do something for Jesus because she was changed by him. Now, I don't know how she did this, there was a list of other women that said they provided for Jesus. I don't know if they sewed and brought in money. They worked in a garden. But they saw who he was, and they wanted to serve. So she put forth effort to serve. All right, what about Nicodemus? What do you know about him? Boys? 
Aaron? Do you remember it? What? Zachariah. Who was Nicodemus? What? It said a ruler of the Jews. Okay, and what did he do? Remember, he came to seek Jesus at night. <laughs> he wanted to understand who Jesus was. His whole purpose was, I want to understand who you are. I want to understand what you're teaching. What am I supposed to learn from this? So let's turn to, um, after he met with Jesus and had this big old long discussion, let's see how this changed his life. Let's turn to John 7 and read verses 50 and 51. John 7, verses 50 and 51. It says here, Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus earlier and was both a ruler and a Pharisee, spoke up. He says, does our law decide about a man's guilt without first listening to him and finding out what he is doing? This is when they have brought Jesus in front of the, the Sanhedrin and they're throwing all this blame on him. And Nicodemus is saying, hey, wait, time out, stop. We need to listen to this man. So here he actually speaks up for Jesus. Then we find later in John 19, at the very end, Nicodemus brings a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes and helps wrap Jesus' body for burial. So after his encounter with Jesus, he's changed. He doesn't just blend in with the other Pharisees and the Sanhedrin. and He steps up to the plate, speaks up for Jesus, and then wraps his body up and is help, you know, helps him to be buried. Then, I know you know this, children. Who's the Zacchaeus? He climbed a tree. Why did he climb a tree? Yeah. So he wanted to see Jesus so badly, he climbed a tree. I mean, if you were standing there, you're like, look at that little funny little man. Why is he, what's he doing up there? But he didn't care what anybody thought. He wanted to see Jesus. So Jesus saw him, he visited him at his house, and let's see what the result was. Let's turn to Luke 19 and read verse 8. How does this affect Zacchaeus? Luke 19, verse 8. This is what Zacchaeus says to Jesus. He says, look, Lord... Here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. So that'd be like if you broke your friend's toy that costs $20. Four times that is 80. You'd be willing to pay back $80? So Zacchaeus' encounter with Jesus resulted in a changed heart that wanted to make things right. So, what do all these people have in common? They sought Jesus, and they were forever changed. They didn't just want a better livelihood, more money, ease, comfort, etc. They wanted Jesus. So people in biblical times sought Jesus because they saw his character, his love, his mercy, truth, compassion. Like it said in um. That verse in John, they saw that he was full of grace and truth. And when they saw this, it caused a change in their hearts, which we can see by their resulting actions. Well, the same can happen to us when we encounter Christ. And where do we encounter him? In his word. So, we're going to use just a couple examples. Let's turn to Isaiah 40, and we will read verses 21 to 31. And see how encountering God can help change us. 40, verse 21 to 31. Forty, verse twenty one through thirty one. says, do you not know? Have you not heard? 
Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He, God, sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. Well, he's powerful. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So, after reading this, how many of you want to hear more and be like our awesome God? There's a whole lot in there about God. This should not only cause us to want Him more, but also to help us, we want to apply His character to our lives. So when we read through this, we read about His power and strength. We know that we can do what He's called us because He has all we need. When we read about His understanding, then we want to make wise choices led by Him. When we read that he never grows tired or weary, we know that we can press on in the face of trouble. And then you can remember even reading about the children of Israel and all of God's goodness to them, even when they griped and complained. And then we say, we want to have goodness like that. So as you read powerful scriptures like Isaiah, or whether it's a story about how he is kind or good, we it's just like watching those movies and we say, hey, I want to be like that character. Well, it's the same thing here. I want to be like you, God. I want, I want that. And then God's character will change our desires, which results in action. So let's turn and we'll do another one, read about God and how that can change our desires. We're going to read Psalm 90, verses 1 through 4. Psalm 90, verses 1 through 4. It says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. So here we see some more of God's character. Here we see that God's eternal. Because we see that he's eternal, we want to view things in light of eternity. We don't want to fret about all the bad things that happen each day and see them like, oh, this is the end of the world, this is horrible. Because we know God has already been there. He's ahead of us, he's behind us. So this changes our whole, our outlook on life when we can remember this is who God is. He's eternal. When we see Jesus' compassion to the weary, the hurting, the enslaved, then we want to be more like him, to have his compassion. So these are just a couple examples as you, you read your Bible. I mean, the Bible's full of things that show us what God's character is like, whether it's a story about him or it's actually God is everlasting, God is eternal, God has strength. We can glean from here all the time what God's character is. 
And that should stir us to want him more and therefore to want to be more like him. His character changes what we do and what we say because our perspective is changed. So we can see how seeing Christ and his attributes makes us want to see Christ, which makes us want to be like Christ. So it's an ongoing process. The more we see him, the more we want him, the more we want to be like him, and then more, 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 more. Kind of like the opposite of what we were talking about in Sabbath school. It's not, I want more stuff, 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 stuff. And that never makes us happy. So the more we understand how great, mighty, awesome, kind, and loving our Heavenly Father is, the more we want of Him and the more we are changed by Him. So the question is, what about you? Do you want to change your life focus, your goals, your ambitions, and your plans and be more like Jesus? Do you want to learn from Him, to change and to grow, to be set free inside? Well, then here's a few steps that you can take. One of them is when you read the Bible, read it with a focus on seeing God's attributes. Whether it's the story of the woman at the well, this shows us that God's love does not discriminate and that God's love makes time for others. So therefore, we're stirred because we want to be like that. Or we can read a verse that clearly states an attribute of God, like Psalm 103.8. It says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Then take that attribute like mercy and ask God to help you see how he has shown you mercy. Ask for his help in reflecting that same mercy to others. Just like when we read of his might in Isaiah. Ask God to help you rest in his might. It changes... And it just changes your whole perspective on life. It helps you be able to rest. It helps you want to help others. So you see how his character changes the way we live our lives. And then, of course, like I mentioned, Corey Ten Boom. You can also read biographies of great Christians. You read, what were their struggles? How did they change? We can be stirred to action through reading of others' trials, their steps of faith, see their service to God in the midst of adversity. And then the third way... I always say this, is to ask. Just ask God. God has promised in Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I like how David asks. Let's turn to Psalm 51 and read verses 10 through 13. Psalm 51, 10 through 13. It says, Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. So here we find that David is asking God to do the work, to create in him a pure heart, to renew a steadfast spirit, to give him a willing spirit. God does the work, but we need to fan the flames of desire for him. So back to that, it's important to note that I never said we should try to change ourselves or that we should seek after being good or doing good. I mean, anybody can do that. I mean... We can't always change ourselves, but there are things that we can change. I know plenty of people who are not Christians who are great, wonderful people. They have changed themselves and decide to be good. The problem with that is either, one, we can't do it, or if we do it in our own strength, then it's all about us. But if our focus is, God, I want to see you. I want to understand you. I want your character. I'm going to read about you then it's as if his character is changing us instead of us making ourselves be good. If that makes any sense. So God's word says to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So in order to be changed in God's likeness, we need to read about him, spend time with him, seek him with all of our heart. These things will change us and give us a greater desire to be like him. As we come to know him more... 
Just like the disciples, we'll be willing to leave our plans for the day and carry out the Great Commission by bringing someone to an awareness of Jesus. Like Mary, we'll serve Jesus by serving others. Like Nicodemus, our involvement in the lives of others will increase. And like Zacchaeus, we will want to make things right with whomever we have wronged. So don't just perfunctor, perfunctorily, can't get that out, read his word, study it. Study God's attributes and ask God particularly for that attribute to become a part of your character. When we fully, with radical abandonment, encounter Christ, his love, his mercy, his steadfastness, his compassion, and any other great and wonderful character trait that we see in him, then our heart will change and result in action for him, for his glory, not ours. We can tell him, Father, when I see who you are, then I want to change in who I am. Let me see how great, mighty, awesome, kind, and loving you are, because I want to be forever changed by you. I want to close with one more verse, Second Corinthians 3, verse 18. Second Corinthians 3, verse 18. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So let's contemplate God's glory, his character, this week and be transformed. Amen.